Unit 7, The Proof Method, The 8 Basic Rules of Inference. Now that you've mastered truth tables, we're going to ask you to put aside everything you've done with truth tables and start something that is completely different from what we've done before. So the proof method, as you may have gotten from your book, is a different approach to doing problems. So as opposed to the mechanical plug-in truth values for every possible combination, what the proof method and the basic inference rules do is allow you to demonstrate how particular premises lead to a particular conclusion. So as you're doing problems from this point on, so in units 7, 8, and 9, the proofs that you will be asked to do will already assume that the arguments are valid. In other words, you won't have to determine whether the arguments are valid and then do a proof. You will be able to do the proof. You'll be able to derive the conclusion using the premises and the rules that we're about to introduce to you. So it's a different approach. In the one, we're just asking, is this valid or not? In the other, I might want to know, well, how do I get there? Right? And that's what the rules of inference are about. They're about showing or demonstrating how to get there. Now, as your book notes, it's important to know the distinction or to make the distinction between forms and instances. So the form of an argument, the form that a premise can have is different than the instance it can take on, right? So there's a number of basic forms, and we're going to be introducing particular forms that are rules in um, sentential logic. But we want to be sure that we recognize that these are just variables, that when we put lowercase letters, the P, Q, and R, and S, that these represent any statement. So you could substitute anything in for those letters. So as we're doing proofs, it's going to be extremely important that you recognize what is the main connective and then what is the form that's being used. So I'll give you some of uh, some examples of these uh, in just a minute. So when we're talking about forms and instances, imagine I have a very simple statement like P and Q. Now that's a very basic form, right? A simple conjunction. The thing is that P and Q if I, were, if I truly view these as variables, I can substitute in for those any other statement. So imagine I have a statement A, therefore B, and C or D. Notice this is just a substitution instance of P and Q, right? The main connective is a conjunction in both cases. This whole thing can be thought of as P, this whole thing can be thought of as Q, and they're connected by a conjunction. And if I have, again, P and Q, I can also substitute in not A and not B, where A and B are substitutions for P and Q. And this is where statements can get very complex, even though they might be very long. So, for instance, using the same conjunction, model here, I could have something like A therefore B or D, put some brackets around that, add a conjunction here and say C therefore D therefore E. And at the end of the day, that's just a conjunction, right? Ultimately, this whole piece here is a substitution for P, this whole thing is a substitution for Q, and all I have is a particular substitution instance of that conjunction. And this works with any number of connectives, right? So any connective we have. So if I were to just erase here, and let's try another one. If I have a simple horseshoe statement and say P therefore Q. Well, P therefore Q, it's easy. I could have A therefore B, or I could have A therefore B, therefore C, therefore D. And this is also just a substitution instance of that horseshoe statement with the main connective being the horseshoe. And I can have A and D, therefore R or S, doesn't matter. And again, you could think in terms of this is P, this is Q, they're separated or connected, I should say, by a horseshoe statement. So a substitution instance, this means that when I'm doing, when I'm looking at my rules of inference, which we're going to introduce, they're presented as variables, right? They're going to be 
for example, something like modus ponens is P therefore Q, P and Q, and I'll talk about what this means. Again, if you've read the book, you probably have some idea already, but notice that P therefore Q, P therefore Q means that I could have something simple like A therefore B, A therefore B. That's one substitution instance. Note also that with that same P therefore Q, P, Q, I could say A therefore B, therefore C, A therefore B, therefore C. And that is also a substitution instance, right? Because this is P, therefore Q, P is repeated, Q is down here. So you notice that when we look at these rules, we can't think of them as only single letters. We really do have to think of them as forms, as variables that we can substitute any statement in for the P, the Q, the R, the S, depending on what rule we're looking at. So this is why that forms, forms versus instances is important, a distinction. And we've been using this all along. You'll notice, remember, we're doing translations, um, we do the general forms. We've been doing substitution instances like this. Anytime we've identified the main connective of a complex statement or a compound statement, we've been doing this. But it's important to realize that as we're going on from this point, we have to look at these rules as simply um, variables in which uh, any number of different statements could be substituted in for them. I want to talk now about the proof process, about what proofs are. I'm assuming at this point you've already read the textbook, you have some idea of what's going on, but I just want to give just a general overview of the proof process, give you sort of an example, and then just go through each of the rules one by one. So logic proofs are in many ways similar to what you may have done in geometry. So if you remember in geometry, you were given a number of axioms, you know, what is a point, what is a line, what is a right angle, and so forth, and then you were asked to prove some theorem in geometry using those axioms that you start with. Same thing sort of is uh, going on when we're doing logic proofs, right? You're given some premises, you're given a conclusion, and you're saying, here, using these rules that we have, these eight basic inference rules, and then later we'll supplement that with some replacement rules, Using these rules, can you show me, can you demonstrate how do you get from these premises, these assumptions, to this conclusion? So the fact that you can get from those premises to, to that conclusion not only shows that the argument is valid, but it shows you how they logically lead from one premise to that particular conclusion. So from each of the premises to the conclusion, because oftentimes those steps are skipped. We can look at these premises as this, 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 and this, and therefore it leads to this conclusion. You say, but why does it lead? How do we get there? I understand each of those premises, and sometimes, for example, when we're looking at a sentence in English or an argument that's given to us in English, we can sort of see the structure. We kind of understand how one premise leads to another. But when we're doing logic, we want to have sort of um, a demonstration, something that explicitly tells me how I go from these premises to this conclusion. And that's what the rules of inference do. So proofs are, as you see here, they are demonstrations of how we get from a set of premises to a particular conclusion. So you're showing me how that, how you go, how that happens in the proof. Okay, so what I've got here is a very basic proof. And what I want to do is just walk through the steps of doing a demonstration so that you can see what you're going to be doing for the remainder of the course. I don't expect at this point that you actually know all the rules or even understand exactly the application of the rules. So what I'm going to do here is just sort of go through a proof, show you what it's going to look like, and then we're going to go through each of the rules individually, start making you comfortable with doing, doing these problems. So I've got a, a problem here. And what we do in a demonstration is simply list how we derive a new line from the previous lines that are given. So I've got four premises here. The conclusion I'm looking for is T. So that's going to be the last line of my proof will be the conclusion. So what I'm going to do is simply add another line, say, okay, from line one and line four, because I know a rule called modus ponens, I know that that gives me Q and R. And that's from lines one and line four, MP for modus ponens. So what I've done is said that line one and four lead me to this new line. I can derive that from what's given. Now Q and R, as a conjunction, there's another rule that says, Oh, when I have a conjunction, I can break that conjunction apart. So I get Q from line 5 
through a process called simplification, another rule. So I was able to derive that. Now that rule makes perfect sense. And as we go over, you'll see when I have Q and R, when I have two things, then necessarily it means I have one of those two things, right? That's a logically that follows, right? And as I go through these steps, what you'll notice is that each of these rules that I'm applying are what we call truth preserving. So in other words, every line comes from another line that is justified in some way that's a valid move. And in fact, if I were to do a little truth table for this move, so if you looked at Q and R and then said, therefore Q, and you did a truth table for it, you would actually be able to show that that's in fact a, va a valid argument. Q and R, therefore Q. Q and R, therefore R. Both are valid arguments, and we could demonstrate that with the truth table. So your truth tables actually can come, come into play if you wanted to prove the rules that we were using are actually valid, sort of mini valid arguments. Okay, so back to the proof. I now have Q by itself, and I notice that this Q is also repeated here. And there's another rule again that I just used, the modus ponens rule, and that would allow me to derive the following, S or T. And that would come from lines two and line six, modus ponens again. So again, if you don't understand these rules, if you've read over the chapter and you're still not sure how these are working, that's fine. Just showing that this is the sort of what you can expect that you will be doing by the end of the course. Now I've got SRT. It turns out that I'm still looking for T and there I see the T and the question is, can I get it out of that statement? So it's not the same thing as, a, as simplification, the fact that I have S or T, even though that's true, I don't necessarily know that T is true. So I can't just put down T because it's possible that T is false and S is true. So if we think of this in terms of truth tables, S or T, therefore T, doesn't necessarily follow. In fact, that would be an invalid argument, right? It's possible that T is false and S or T is true. So what do I do? Well, I have another rule that I'll be able to apply, but first I'm gonna take and see that I have a not S. So from line three, from simplification, I'm gonna pull out not S. And now I've got something that we've sort of seen before, right? I've got S or T it's not the case that S, so therefore, it must be the case that T. And this is another rule called disjunctive syllogism I'm using. So from line seven and line eight, disjunctive syllogism, and now I've got my conclusion. So again, the argument I already knew was valid. So it's a valid argument, but now notice that I've actually given you a demonstration of how the premises lead to this conclusion. Not just that they do, not just that it is valid, but here's the demonstration of why it's valid. Here are the rules. Now, each of these rules, again, is truth preserving, right? And you've seen these forms before. You've seen things like um, this disjunctive syllogism, P or Q, not P, therefore Q. You've seen that, right? When I say I have Italian or I'm going to have Chinese for dinner, I didn't have Italian, therefore I had Chinese. Notice that's a valid argument form. And it also happens to be one of our rules of inference. And this is what we're going to be doing from this point on in the course. We're simply going to be looking for those forms. Now, again, they can be hidden, right? So P or Q, it could be A and B or C or D. And then I could have not A and B. Well, that's the same thing as the disjunctive syllogism. Same form as this up here. It's just that I've now substituted this for P, this for Q, this is not P, and that's Q. So again, this is what this is how the rules, this is by the form instance, and this is what the demonstrations are going to look like. They're not always going to be straightforward. So when you look at the rules, you're not always going to see something that is a single letter. It might be a very complex statement. That's a substitution instance for one of these. But that's what we're going to be doing for the remainder of the course. The eight basic inference rules. So now what I'd like to do is just walk you through each of the rules one by one, give you just some examples of um, some substitution instances for those rules, and, um, and then start by doing some very basic proofs. So I gave you an example of a proof already, but once we've gone through all the rules and you have sort of a sense of how they work, then I want to just start going through the proof process itself so that you just sort of get comfortable working on those. Okay, so the first rule we're going to go through is modus ponens. Modus ponens, as, I've, as you've seen before, P therefore Q, P 
therefore Q. So this is modus ponens. Generally, when we talk about modus ponens, you will cite the rule as MP. And modus ponens has two lines to it. So in order to do the modus ponens move, you need two separate lines that have a particular valid argument form. So P therefore Q, P. So what this says is that I have something on one line in a horseshoe statement. Whatever is in the antecedent of that line is repeated on another line. So I have, say I have line one, line two. And what that says is now I'm allowed to write down whatever's in that second spot. So sometimes it's easier to think of it as just placeholders, right? To think of it as, as blank space that I can put something in. So a very easy one, obviously, is something like A, therefore B. A is repeated, therefore I'm allowed to write down B. So I'm introducing this new line in a proof based on the previous two lines. So this line is modus ponens. Again, it's a valid argument. If you were to do a truth table for this, A, therefore B, A, therefore B, you would find that this is valid. And we can substitute in for P and Q any statement that we want. So I can have a more complex statement. I could have A and B, therefore C. I have A and B repeated on another line, therefore I have C. Again, this is the same form. Now, where is the, how do we see the same form? The same form you'll notice is we have P is a substitution for A and B. C is substituted in for Q. Notice that I have P repeated here. Therefore, I'm allowed to write down Q. And that's just what this rule says, that if I have these two lines in which the antecedent is repeated, I can write down whatever the consequent happens to be. So again, you can look at it here as sort of a placeholder. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, a negated term or a non-negated term, right? So if I have not A, therefore B, not A on a separate line, I can write down B, right? That's still an instance of modus ponens. Same thing with the, the consequent. If I have A, therefore not B, A is repeated, I can write down not B. And if both of them are negated, so take another instance where I have not A, therefore not B, not A, therefore not B. Okay, so the next rule is modus tollens, and modus tollens is also a rule that applies to horseshoe statements. So modus tollens says P, therefore Q, not Q, therefore not P. So if I have a horseshoe statement on one line and the opposite of the consequent, the negation of the consequent, then I'm allowed to write down the negation of the antecedent. So again, another way to think of it, I have something in the antecedent and I have something in the consequent. On another line, I have the opposite of the consequent. Therefore, I'm allowed to write down the opposite of the antecedent, right? Let's make a better negation there. The opposite of the antecedent there. So there we go. So again, it's very easy to see. Very simple example. If I have A, therefore B, not B, therefore not A. If I have not A, therefore B, not B, then what I would get would be not, not A. So we can think of it, again, as simply a substitution, right? So if I've got P, therefore Q, I've got not Q, therefore I've got not P. And in this case, P is simply the not, not A. Not A was a substitution instance, right, where we put, we put it in there. So the negations are often the thing that throw us when we're doing um, these or applying these rules. Negations can sort of make things tricky, but you have to keep in mind, what is it am I substituting in? So that's why, so that's why sometimes it's helpful to think in terms of these sort of placeholders here.
right? So in each of these instances, is whatever is in the antecedent, whatever is in the consequent, anything can go in there. So if I said not A, therefore not B, and then I have not not B, then I have not not A. And again, this whole thing is P, this whole thing is Q. Since I know Q is not B, then I get not P, right? So this blank space sometimes is helpful in thinking about how things should be substituted. Again, think of them as variables. Think of these spots, think of these, these things as just placeholders for any more complex statement. And it doesn't have to be single letters. It can, again, just like as we showed before with modus ponens, it can be any formula can fit in there. So if I look at position one here in the antecedent, if I have A therefore B, therefore C or D, and then another line I have not C or D, then I can derive not the quantity A therefore B. And again, it's a modus, polen, a modus tollens move. Since I have P, Q, the opposite of Q, therefore the opposite of P, right? Those negations. So anything that substitutes in or has this form, again, I have to be able to identify that main connective. Once I know the main connective is a horseshoe statement, once I know I have the opposite of the consequent on another line, I'm allowed to write down this um, conclusion here. It's sort of, again, in the course of the proof, as you saw before as we're doing a proof, this is just another line that I can add that hopefully will lead me to my conclusion, right? So the reason I'm applying these rules ultimately is that by um, breaking down statements or deriving new lines, that I'm actually coming closer to the conclusion. Now, one thing that um, should mention here is that the negations, while necessary, at times can sort of be ignored in a way. So I want to give you, let me give you an example of what I mean. When I have something like not A, therefore not B, and let's say I just had B on another line. Now, when looking at this, if I were to look at this and say, well, that's not an instance of the rule, right? So I've substituted in not A for P, not B for Q. So, so far so good. But on this line, this line here, there's no negation. But in a way, there actually is, or this does in fact follow the rule, right? Because what does the rule say? So if I look up here, and let me just erase my x's and y's over here. If I look at this, what does this say? It says that whatever is in this spot here, what I need is the opposite of it in this spot on another line. Well, what's the opposite of not B is just B by itself. So we can sort of in our head think not not B. So the rule is actually saying that whatever I have, if I have something in the, antece in the consequent and have the opposite of that on another line, what am I allowed to write down? I'm allowed to write down the opposite of the antecedent. What's the opposite of not A? Well, that would just be A. What's the opposite of not B? Well, that would be B, or not not B, as the case may be. A little too many Bs there. But ultimately, you can see that what this rule is saying is that what's in this first position, the opposite of it ends up here. What's in the second position, I need the opposite of it on another line. And in this case, this example I've given you over here, both of those conditions apply. Now, if that seems confusing right now, that's fine. Um, what I would tell you is just simply um, use the negations as you go along. We'll, we'll actually give you a way of introducing negations so that you can actually put them in there when we get to the replacement rules. But you should note that this example I've given here is a valid instance, right? That's a valid substitution instance. And this again is where people often get a little bit confused because the negations can throw you if you don't keep clear what you're substituting in for what and what the rule is actually saying, All right? The rule is saying that I need the opposite of the consequent on another line and I can write down the opposite of the antecedent. 
right? And that's exactly what's going on here. But again, modus tollens, to give you some examples, as we go through problems, you'll start to see the various ways in which modus tollens is used and the, difference, the different ways that complex statements make up modus tollens, um, make up instances of the modus tollens rule. Next rule is hypothetical syllogism. And hypothetical syllogism is one you may actually remember from even as far back as grade school. P therefore Q, Q therefore R, therefore P therefore R. Now in this you might you might recognize um, that it's almost as if we're sort of crossing off terms, right? Getting rid of the middle terms. So a lot of times you you've probably seen arguments like this is one of the very basic things that are, is often taught in critical thinking, or even early early critical thinking when you're talking about grade school high school sort of thing. You know, um, if you go to school, then you will learn. If you learn, then you'll graduate. Therefore, if you go to school, then you'll graduate. Right? This sort of hypothetical syllogism, this sort of reasoning, if then reasoning, is pretty common. And this is sort of the formalization of that. Again, I can sort of give it in a more abstract form. One, therefore, two, something in the antecedent, as long as the consequent of one horseshoe statement has the same um, antecedent in another, then I'm allowed to derive this. So again, if that helps you to visualize what you're doing as a replacement, in this case, it's straightforward. As long as there's a repeat, whatever is in um, the second position and this, as long as these things are the same, then I can write down what's in the first and third position, right? So this is pretty straightforward. Um, most of the examples of hypothetical syllogism you're going to see immediately because there is that repetition, right, between the Q that we see here in the in the basic form of the rule All right so to give again just some very basic examples if i have a therefore b b therefore not c then again thinking of this almost as crossing out the b's i have a therefore not c right that's what follows so i'm allowed to write down if i have one line with a horseshoe statement in which the consequent of one and the antecedent of the other match up, then I can put together the antecedent and the consequent of those two. Um, it can be a complex statement, C and D, therefore not D, therefore E. And if I have not D, therefore E, therefore F, then again, Think of these as sort of canceling each other out, C and D, therefore F. So again, this is all just repetition. It's just a substitution instance in each of these cases. Right? So in here, I have P, therefore Q, Q, therefore R, P, therefore R. And again, you can just write those above if you need to see that form, that structure. Um, it's pretty easy to do. In this case, negations and that don't really confuse as much because, again, any substitution, including one with negations on it, is pretty obvious, right? You have the exact same thing when we're looking at the Qs here. They're just going to be identical, whatever they are. In P and R, it doesn't actually matter what you substitute in for P and R. So, again, if I have another example, um, not D, therefore not the quantity C and D, as long as I have the same thing in the antecedent on the next line, regardless of what it is, not D, therefore not B, I can derive that, right? So again, this whole thing, thing in this term is P, this whole thing is Q, there's that Q repeated right here, and then this is simply R, right? Nothing has changed, just a substitution of not B in for the R. And therefore I can write P, therefore R. And that's hypothetical syllogism. Now given the rules that we've already covered, simplification is going to be an extremely easy rule to apply. So simplification 
is a one line rule. So notice that the other the others had two um, two lines. Simplification is a, is a single line rule. It just says that if I have a conjunction, then I can write down either of the conjuncts on another line. And again, this makes complete intuitive sense that if I have two things, then I must have at least one of those things, right? And again, in a proof, we know that proofs are truth preserving. That means everything that appears in a proof, proof is true. So if P and Q is true, and I know my truth table, so go back to those truth tables that I told you wouldn't have to use, but at least use them for to help you understand the rule. If I know that P and Q is true, then P must be true and Q must be true. Therefore, I can sort of break apart the conjunction, right? And that's essentially the way I like to think of simplification. It's breaking apart a conjunction statement into its two conjuncts. So here, it doesn't matter what I substitute in for P and Q. There's very little that can actually be confusing, right? So if I have not A and not B, well, clearly I have not A. If I have not A or B and C, then I have C. But I also, not A or B and C, I also have not A or B, right? So as long as I keep straight that this is a substitution for P, this is a substitution for Q, well, then I can simplify P out, right? Here again, if I have P and Q, then I know I can substitute P in this case, or again, with my substitutions here, P and Q, I can substitute, I can pull out Q, simplify out Q. Now, one of the things I want to be um, very specific about is that the eight basic rules can only apply to entire lines. So imagine I have a statement like um, A and B, therefore C. And you might look at a statement like that and say, oh, I'm going to simplify out A, right? That is not a valid simplification move, right? The In order to apply the, any of the rules, any of the eight basic rules, to apply any of the eight basic rules, these apply to entire lines. So the main connective has to be a conjunction in order to do simplification. You can't simplify on part of a line. And the reason we have that is because if you were to do that, you would end up with an invalid argument, All right? So you can't, the truth in this case wouldn't be guaranteed. So when you see a conjunction in any part, I could have A and B and C or D in this case, I can pull out A and B and then simplify out A, but I can't just say A and B and C or D. What I'm not allowed to do is just go directly to A, right? That move is not valid. In other words, I'd have to go through the double simplification process. I'd have to pull out A and B first and then simplify A out of that. So I could do that in multiple steps. I just can't do it in one. So just to, say, to sort of go over that again, if I have an instance in which I have A and B and C or D, so the conjunction is my main connective, and I want to get A out, the first step would be, so imagine that's line one, line two would be A and B from one simplification. And then from there, I could then say A from two simplification, or I could also say B from two simplification. But notice that I can only do simplification on the entire line. So the main connective of whatever statement I'm dealing with has to be the conjunction. It can't be in part of the line, right? It can't be in a complex statement or compound statement somewhere. Again, it's possible in this case to get A out and B out. It's just that I can't go directly from here to here. That's not allowed by the rule. So simplification is just taking a conjunction, breaking it apart. Conjunction can be just be thought of as the opposite of simplification. All right, so in conjunction, what the conjunction says is that if I have something on one line and something on another line, then it's obvious that I have both those things. All right, if I have P and I have Q, Therefore, I have P and Q, right? And that's simple. If I have a pen, 
I have a pencil, then obviously I have a pen and a pencil, right? So there's nothing. And again, these are truth preserving. And notice that if in a proof I'm given a single letter P on a line, I'm given Q on another line. Well, those are both true because they appear in the proof, right? We assume that anything that's a premise is true. If P is true and Q is true, then clearly P and Q must be true. So it's truth preserving. If I did a truth table, you'd see that this would also end up being a valid argument. So it doesn't matter what I'm putting together, right? So if I have A therefore B, C or D on lines, then what can I logically derive from that? Well, A therefore B and C or D, right? That's an instance of conjunction. So that's all conjunction says is I can put anytime I have something on a line, I can always conjoin it with something else on another line. And it doesn't matter what that other thing is, right? So if I have A on a line and I have C, therefore D on a line, then by conjunction, I can get A and C, therefore D, right, with that. And again, the parentheses in this case are necessary so that I can maintain that the um, conjunction is the main connective of that statement. And you can conjoin, again, anything, A, therefore B, therefore D, and C, therefore R or S. And if I wanted to, I don't know why I would want to, but I can say A, therefore B, therefore D, and again, keeping everything straight, C, therefore R or S. And again, I have the main connective, I have this thing, and I have this thing. And that's all conjunction says. If I have one thing on a line, I have another thing on a line, I have both of those things. So again, very easy rule. Think of it as the opposite of simplification or think of simplification as the opposite of conjunction either way. But in one case, I'm taking two things and breaking them apart. In the other case, I'm taking two separate things, putting them together. And that's what we're doing here with conjunction. Addition. The rule of addition is a deceptively simple rule. And it's one that students often um, find a hard time actually using when doing proofs or seeing that they can use it or remembering that they can use it. I sometimes refer to this as the godlike power of addition. Because what addition states is the following. If I have something on a line, P, then I'm allowed to write this on another line. So if I have P, I can write P or Q. Or if I have something on a line, I can write P or Q. So in other words, it can be either in the left side or the right side of the or statement. So this allows me to introduce something entirely new into a proof as long as I have some valid instance on a line, right? Or so I should say some true instance of something on a line. Now, this seems odd that I should be able to introduce something into a proof that's truth preserving. But if you think again about your truth tables, this makes complete sense. If I have something on a line such as A and B, I know that A and B is true because it appears in my proof. So if that's a given, I assume A and B is a true statement. If A and B is true, then clearly A and B or C must also be true. Why? Because again, looking at my truth tables, I know in an OR statement, as long as one of the disjuncts is true, then the entire statement itself is true, All right? So as long as A and B is true, and it is by definition because it appears in on a line in my proof, then A and B or C must also necessarily be true. So with this, you can introduce an OR statement when you need it. Now, you might need it for any number of reasons, right? You might want to do a modus ponens move where you have, imagine you have something like um, A or B, therefore C, and you have A on a line. You might say, well, I'd really like to do modus ponens, but I don't have A or B. How can I make an OR statement when I don't have anything? I don't have one. Well, addition, right? So the next move, if this was a line and this was a line in sort of a mini proof, I could simply say A or B, and that would be from line two addition. 
And now I have that modus ponens move I need. So if you remember modus ponens, P therefore Q, P therefore Q. So I would be allowed to write down C by one and three modus ponens. But notice what I did is I added that B that I needed. Now this is the thing that, that often is sort of troubling for students. For some reason, there seems to be this resistance to introducing something out of nothing. And that's why I call it this godlike power of addition. You know, as I'm jokingly, of course, calling it, but you are in, a, in essence creating something um, from almost nothing. It's not just you can introduce anything into a proof, right? I can't just make up something, but if something already appears in my proof on a line, then I can add anything I want to it. And when I say you can add anything, you can add anything. So these examples have been single letters, but imagine I have A on a line, therefore I could say A or C, therefore D and E. And that would be addition, right? Because A is true, it doesn't matter what I add, it doesn't matter whether it's true or false, in essence, because as an, as an entire statement, as a single compound statement, that is a true statement. So it is truth preserving, but you can add anything you want. If I have not A on a line, I can say not A or not C, therefore D. Or not A, therefore I can say not A or not the quantity B, therefore D. All right. Doesn't matter what I want to add. I think of this as P, and then this, of course, becomes P, or this whole thing becomes Q. Right? And the alternate here, just to, just to put it, is that sometimes you want what you're adding to be in the front. Sometimes you want it to be in the back of what you're adding. So um, if, for example, in the, exa um, the one I gave up here, Let's imagine for a moment that I, slight, I change the example just slightly. And I say, well, what if I have B on another line, right? So instead of having A, I have B on another line. What I need is A or B. So I don't want to add B or something. What I want to be able to do is just add A. So the rule allows me to place whatever it is I'm adding either before the thing or after the thing. Again, the logic you'll notice doesn't make any difference because once I've done once I have the addition and or statement, A or B is the same thing as B or A, logically speaking, those statements are gonna come out the same. And then I can still do C by one and three modus ponens. In some logic books, this move of adding the um, thing you want to add to what's on a line to the front or back isn't allowed. In other words, it, it allows this instance, you have something on a line, you can add something to the line but it doesn't allow this, and it requires you to use one of our replacement rules, um, the commu commutation rule. So commutation in other logic books, other systems, in ours, it allows you to add either way. It doesn't matter which way um, you wanna add, whether you wanna put the thing that you're adding before or after what appears on the line. So this is just a, a way of sort of simplifying, so you can sort of simplify the number of steps in your proof. But you can see addition is, very easy. Anything you want to add, you may add to the line. Now, again, remember addition only applies to an or statement. You can't create a conjunction this way, right? Because one, it's quite possible that what you introduce would be false and would thus make the entire statement false. So imagine a situation like the following. So if I have A in a line and I were to introduce something like C and D, if C and D is false, then A and C and D will also be false. So even though A is true in this case, since I don't know if C and D are actually true, I can't be guaranteed that this conjunction is going to be true. So when we're dealing with addition, it only applies to the OR statement. The OR statement, as we've seen, logically tells us that once we have something true on a line, it doesn't matter what is in the, in this case, right disjunct, for example. It doesn't matter whether it's true or false. We know that the whole statement, P or Q, is going to be true. The final rule we're gonna look at is dilemma, or sometimes referred to as constructive dilemma. So the dilemma has the following form. P, therefore Q, 
R, therefore S, P or R, therefore Q or S. Now the constructive dilemma may not look intuitive. So at first glance, you might say exactly why is this a rule? But one, we can of course just go right back to our truth tables and show you that if you were to do a truth table for this, you would see that this is a, in fact, a valid argument. So this rule that if you have these three lines with this configuration, you can derive the QRS. But you can also see that it does, in fact, make some intuitive sense. So what the horseshoe statement, so if we assume that P therefore Q is true, and we assume R therefore S is true. Now look at the P or R. If we look at P or R in this case, we know that at least one of those two letters is going to be true, right? So since we know that an or statement is true when at least one of its disjuncts is true, then for it to have appeared in our proof, we know that P or R, P or R the full statement, P or R is true, right? We know that already because it appears in our proof, which means that either P is true, R is true, or they're both true. Well, if we can make that inference, so if I know that I have P or R in my proof, then one of those is going to be true. Either P is going to be true or R is going to be true or both. And if one or both of those is true, then I know that with a, a modus ponens move, that both Q or S would also follow. So you can see it does make some sense, right? Sort of intuitive sense, even if it doesn't at first glance, you can see, well, if I know that P or R is true, then if I have one of those true, then one of those would lead to a legitimate modus ponens move where I get Q or I would get S, so it's Q or S is going to be true as well. Now, in most instances, when you actually use this rule, um, it's going to be pretty straightforward. In other words, the most in most cases, you're going to see the pattern immediately. So again, just like our other rules, when you're doing a constructive dilemma, it doesn't matter what I substitute in for the P and Q. So it could be anything. I could have P be something like A and D, therefore C. And then I could have um, R or S, therefore B. And then provided that I had A and D or R or S on another line, I can now derive C or B. And again, it doesn't matter whether I have negations on these. So for example, if these were, if C and B were both negated, then the or statement that was derived would also be negated. But notice again, it's this sort of fill in the blank pattern, right? I have something, therefore something else, something, therefore another something else, and then I have one or position three. Therefore, what can I derive? I can derive two or four. Now, sometimes actually with dilemma, because of the number of lines, because you need three separate lines in order to construct the dilemma, sometimes it is actually very helpful to sort of sketch out what it is you're looking for. So remembering this form and filling in what you have. So oftentimes when you're working a proof, you may notice that you have parts of what you need for the dilemma. And so it's oftentimes helpful to sort of draw these little lines with the blanks and actually fill in the pieces where they go. And then what you can do as you're working the proof is attempt to find these other pieces that you need in order to do the dilemma. So there are numerous examples of dilemma in your book. Um, as we go through proofs, you'll see when we use the dilemma and actually solving proofs to give more examples. But again, this little shorthand in this case is very helpful. So sometimes sort of on a, on a separate sheet of paper, you might want to write down, well, this looks like it might be a constructive dilemma. So I might have something that appears or suggests to me that, you know, for example, my conclusion was an or statement. If I had the conclusion as an or, and I notice that parts of this or statement are found in um, horseshoe statements on another line or an or statement on another line, then it might be 
I wonder if I could derive what I need, the pieces that I need to solve this problem. So again, with, uh, with all these, it's just really a matter of practices, looking at the form, getting comfortable, sort of recognizing the forms, and then um, applying it to the problems. And we'll be doing that as we go over some example problems. What I want to do now is just go over a few example proofs. Now at this stage, I've assumed that you've read the book. You're now watching the lecture and going over these rules one by one. Um, so I'm not assuming at this point that you're actually completely comfortable with the rules or doing proofs. At this stage, um, once you've watched this, you're going to want to go back and do the early exercises in the textbook. And those early exercises will sort of prepare you for doing these full-fledged proofs. So at this point, if you want to stop, it would be a good idea to start by going through the first the first few exercises. So sections one, two, three, and four or so in your book would probably be good where they're just asking you to identify the rules or to um, justify the move that's already been given to you. So you're not doing full-blown proofs, but you're sort of going step-by-step step to learning how to do a proof. What I'm going to do now, though, is just some example proofs. So for those who want, you can watch this now and then go and start by doing the early sections, the early start problems in your textbook. But this is just to give you a good example of how you might think through working the proofs once you get to them. So it's completely up to you whether you'd like to watch or not. If you would like to try some of the simple exercises, the first four sections I would suggest in your textbook and then come back, or you can simply watch this and then go, you know, sort of work through those and, and get to the full-fledged proofs that you're doing completely on your own. Okay, so here I have, um, premises that lead to a conclusion. Oftentimes in your book, they will not be laid out um, vertically, but horizontally. So what you'll do is rewrite these in the sort of horizontal form. So I'm going to take this example problem I have here, and I'm just going to write out the premises. So with doing any proof, of course, we're going to number all our lines. So the first premise is D therefore A or C. The second premise D and not A. And the thing that I'm looking for is C. Now, one way to do a proof um, is to start with the conclusion and work backwards. So sometimes it helps to look at what it is you're trying to find and see if you can sort of work back. So the final step in any proof is obviously the conclusion itself. That'll be the last thing that you're going to justify. So I look here and I see that I've C is my conclusion. So I look around and see where do I see a C in my premises, if that's what I'm trying to get to. Well, in premise one, I see a C right there. So I know right away that what I'm going to need to do is sort of break apart this horseshoe statement to get that A or C by itself. Now, once I have A or C by itself, I'm going to need to break apart that OR statement to get C out um, by itself. So I can see I have a couple of steps. So I already know that the first thing I need to do is figure out how do I break apart a horseshoe statement. So one thing I can do is when, especially when you're starting out with proofs, is simply go to the rules and say which rules apply to the horseshoe statement. So if I look, I can see that modus ponens, modus tollens, and hypothetical syllogism. But it seems that only modus ponens and modus tollens actually break apart a horseshoe statement, right? It's when you have two lines and then you're deriving a single part of the horseshoe statement, the consequent from one of them or the negation of the antecedent. So in this case, I want the consequent. I'm looking at this saying, I want to get A or C by itself. I then go to my second premise. I see I have D and not A. Now, when I see a conjunction, a good rule of thumb with conjunctions is just simply simplify them right off the bat. If I have D and not A, I know that I can get those down to single letters. And oftentimes, having letters by themselves is helpful. So I might look and say, oh, wait, I can do a modus ponens if I had D by itself. So the first thing I might do is say, well, let me get D by itself from line two, simplification. Now, once I have D by itself, I now recognize the pattern, right? So I see I have a D here, D is repeated in another line. I look at my rules and I say, ah, that's a modus ponens. So now I'll do the modus ponens, D, therefore A or C, D, that gives me A or C. And that's from lines one and three modus ponens. So I want to make sure that I justify how I got that. In other words, if there are two lines in the rule, I have to give a two line or two lines for justification, two numbers for justification. 
So now I've got A or C. Now, another thing you might notice is that I've dropped the parentheses. The parentheses are only necessary when I'm trying to set that off from another letter or symbol. So in this case, A or C, I know there's nothing I need to separate it from. So if you want to keep the parentheses, that's fine, but you don't have to. You can sort of drop those when you apply the rule. Now I look at A or C, I go back to my conclusion. I say, I need C by itself. I have an OR statement. So again, if you're not comfortable with the rules, you'd look at the rules and say, what rules apply to OR statements? Well, I've got disjunctive syllogism and addition. Well, it doesn't seem I want to add anything. What I'd like to do is break it apart. And it seems to me that A or C is something that I want to break apart, right? I want to get C out of that. I want to derive it from line four. Well, the only way I could do that is if I had the opposite of A. And it turns out I do in line two. So I might look at line two. And I say, well, I'm going to pull not A out, just like I did with D. So line two, simplification. And now I've got that not A that I want. So notice, I can go to a line more than once. So in a simplification move, I can simplify the left side and the right side. And I could go back and do it again. Of course, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but it wouldn't be incorrect. So just because I've used a line once doesn't mean I can't go back and do something else to that line, either apply a different rule to the line, Later on, we'll be re applying replacement rules to lines or simplifying the other half as we're doing here. So now I've got that not A. I've got A or C. And again, looking at my rules, disjunctive syllogism, A or C, not A, therefore C. And that's from lines 4 and 5, disjunctive syllogism. And I'm now done because here is my conclusion. That's a very sort of simple proof. Now, again, I'm doing this sort of backwards reasoning in solving the problem. Now, if you didn't see that, if you weren't sure where to begin, maybe you looked at the C, maybe you weren't thinking about the A or C as something that you could do, one sort of, sort of hint or tip is to just do what you can with the proof. So sometimes there is a point where you might start not knowing exactly what you're going to do. Line one, there's nothing I can do with it as a single line with a horseshoe statement. Unless I have the antecedent somewhere or the negation of the consequent, there's nothing I can do with it. I also don't have another horseshoe statement to do a hypothetical syllogism or a dilemma. So pretty much line one by itself, I can't do anything. Line two, I could come right out and simplify. So another way I could approach this problem, if I wasn't doing this sort of backward reasoning, all right, starting with the conclusion, maybe I would say, well, imagine I have the proof again. So here are my premises. The first thing I might do is say, well, I'm not exactly sure what to do. I can't do anything with line one. But line two, I already know there is something I could do. I could simplify it. So I might say, well, now I've got D. Maybe I'm not seeing the relationship yet, modus ponens. Um, but I still have something else I can do to line two, which is what we already did, simplify A out. And then at this point, now I have more to work with. Now I have line one that I haven't touched yet. So I've already done two simplifications on two. So now I look at line one, line three, and line four, and I say, what can I do with that? I know I can't use the not A with the A or C because, again, the eight basic rules apply to whole lines. So I can't do a disjunctive syllogism just on this part here. So immediately the D sort of jumps out at me, and I can say A or C from 1, 3 modus ponens, and then like I did before, C from lines 4, 5, disjunctive syllogism. Now notice, it doesn't matter which order you do the proof in. So if you choose to simplify one, then do another move, there's no right or wrong in terms of the steps. So long as your every move that you put in the proof is legitimate, in other words, it's a valid move based on the rules, that's fine. So it's never going to be the same for two people might do a proof in completely different ways, might start from um, using different rules, might see the simplification first. Um, as you get to more complex problems, there's a number of things you could do a replacement rule first. So there's no correct order of steps in a proof. So if your proof doesn't follow my numbers exactly, that's fine. Just make sure that the steps that you've done are all steps that you can justify by appeal to the rules. Okay, so here's another proof, again, given horizontally to the premises, and I'm just going to go and rewrite these um, vertically. So we've got A or B, therefore T, Z, therefore 
A or B. T, therefore, W. And not W. And my conclusion is not Z. Okay, so again, whenever I start a problem, I like to look at what the conclusion is and see if I can sort of work backwards to get to it. Since not Z is my conclusion, and I see I've got not Z, the only other place in this proof where I see a Z is line two. Now the Z is in the antecedent of a horseshoe statement, right, on the left-hand side. Well, how can I get that left-hand Z to be not Z? Well, again, I look at my rules, and I notice that modus tollens, right? So I notice that if it were the case that I had not Q on another line, in this case, not Q is not A or B, then if I had not A or B on another line, I would be able to do a modus tollens and get not Z. So I suspect that what I need now is not A or B. But I don't have not A or B. So if I look at my lines, I see in the first line, first, third, and fourth, there's no not A or B. But in line one, there is A or B in the antecedent. And I say, well, wait a minute. That's the same thing. If I could do a modus tollens on line one, if I could find not T by itself, then I could derive not the quantity A or B, which I could then use on line two to get me to not Z. But I don't have not T, right? I look at line three, I have T therefore W, but I don't have not T. If only I had not W, oh, wait a minute, there I do, I do have not W. So I have not W here, which gets me not T, not T gets me not A or B, the quantity A or B, not the quantity A or B gets me not Z. So in essence, I'm done with the proof. Now, of course, I have to write all that down. Now, if you didn't see all that, if you weren't seeing those, that's fine. At this stage, I wouldn't expect you to. I'm just saying that when I do it in reverse, I can sort of work the proof backwards sometimes, which will help me see where I should start or give me a starting place. Not necessarily where I should, but at least give me something to work with. But now that I've actually done all that, I'm just going to start going through and sort of formally put down um, what I've sort of figured out as I went along. So on line five here, I've got T, therefore W, not W gets me not T. And that's from three and four modus tollens. Now, if you don't see that, you can pause, take a look at the rule, see how I've applied it. But this is really a straightforward application of modus tollens. It looks just like um, the, the basic rule. Now that I've got not T, where else do I see a T? Well, I see it in line one, right? When I mentioned that I want to do another modus tollens. So line six, I might say not A or B, and that's going to be from lines one and lines five, another modus tollens move. Now I've got the quantity not A or B. Now here, you might not see it right away or be thinking. We have a more complex statement, but line two with Z, therefore A or B. I need the opposite of the consequent to get that not Z. Well, there it is. I have it on six, as we already know. So Z, therefore A or B, not the quantity A or B, therefore not Z. And that's line two and six modus tollens. Now my proof's done. Now, what some of you may notice is that A or B is actually repeated in the proof right up on lines one and two. And if you see this relationship, you say, wait a minute, that also reminds me of something where I have two horseshoe statements in which there's a middle term repeated. And it turns out that there is, and that's a hypothetical syllogism. So another way to do this proof, I'll show you the alternate way. So imagine I have the same setup. A or B, therefore T. Z, therefore A or B. T, therefore W and not W. So now another way I could have started this problem would be to look at lines two and lines one. And notice that I have these common terms. So if you imagine, and I'm just gonna put this as a little cheat sheet off to the side here, Z therefore A or B, A or B, Therefore, T, and this is P, Q, Q, R, and that gets me P, 
therefore r. And in this case, p therefore r would be z therefore t. So this is just my cheat sheet, right? That's not part of the actual proof, but I now see I have a hypothetical syllogism. These sort of middle terms cross out and I have this left. So what I could have done when it is, if I saw that, I could get z therefore t from lines one and two, hypothetical syllogism. Now with that z therefore t, I would still need a not t. So I've got t therefore w, not w. That gets me not t from three and four modus tollens. And then not t gets me not z from five and six modus tollens. Now notice in this case, both proofs ended up being exactly the same length. So there's no advantage um, in terms of the number of steps by doing the hypothetical syllogism. But if you were doing this or watching me do this problem and you were looking and say, wait a minute, there's a hypothetical syllogism. Why aren't you doing that? It's just a personal preference. It's what you see. So sometimes it's a necessary move. In other words, you might get to a point in a proof where you can't get any further unless you see that there's a hypothetical syllogism that you have to do. In other cases, you might be able to avoid it entirely. This is what I mean when I say that um, two people can do the exact same proof and go about it in two different ways and still get to the same answer, right? The, a legitimate proof, a legitimate demonstration. Okay, the last example proof, um, as you can see here, I've already written out the premises for us. There's a few more here, so save us a little bit of time. I've already written out the premises vertically. Um, in this case, my conclusion is Z. So if again, if I want to do this, this backward sort of reasoning, how am I going to get Z? Well, the only place it looks like I can get Z is out of line five. I'm going to need to get out of there. Well, that's an or statement. So my first thought would be, well, I need to figure out how to break apart that or statement to get D, therefore Z by itself. And then how would I get Z out? Well, D, therefore Z, if I had D by itself, then I could get Z. So I know two things. I need a not F and I need D by itself. Well, there is a not F in here. It just happens to be in line three. So the question is, how do I get the not F out of line three? Well, I need to have a not C. Well, I don't have not C anywhere on a line by itself at least. But I look at line two and I say, well, there's C, therefore E. If I had not E, then I could get not C, which would get me not F, which would get me D, therefore Z, which would get me a little bit closer. So you can see that this is, this is sort of the backward reasoning. Now, I already have not E. And you say, well, no, no, you don't have not E. You have A and not E. And that's correct. I do. But we know that simplification, because that's an easy one, I know that I can immediately break down line four and get both A and not E by themselves. So that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm just going to go ahead and simplify both of those out of there because I suspect that I'm going to need both letters to solve this proof. So I'm just going to save myself a little bit of time and say, yeah, let me just break those apart so I have them by themselves. Now that not E immediately, I already know what I'm going to do with that. So I don't know exactly how I'm getting C yet. I know that I'm probably going to get it out of that first premise because I haven't done anything with line one yet. But let me just work with what I have. So I see I have not E. C, therefore E. That gets me not C from lines one, uh, two and seven, modus tollens. So now I've got not C. Not C, when I have C or not F, right? I wanted that not F to get the D, therefore Z. I see C or not F. Now I've got an or statement. So again, if you're unclear about the rules, you're not remembering, look at the rules for the or statement. Turns out it's either a disjunctive syllogism or it's addition, unless it's part of a constructive dilemma. Now it's not an addition move, so it must be disjunctive syllogism. So I'm looking and saying C or not F, not C, and that gives me not F. So remember, I just, when you look at the or statement P or Q, Whatever Q is, is something that I'm allowed to now write down and break apart. So I've got not F, and I wanted that not F for line five. So my next move is going to be F or D therefore Z, not F, therefore D, therefore Z. So put the justification here. So let me just three and eight was a disjunctive syllogism, and so was five and nine. 
make sure I have all my justifications here. Now I've got that d therefore z. What I need is d by itself. And again, as I mentioned, it's up there on line one. So I have a or b, therefore c or d. The question is, how do I get that d out of there? Well, I have not c, and it would be nice I could do a disjunctive syllogism. So notice, if I could get that by itself, c or d, I'd be fine. But I, what I really need is a or b. The question is, do I have A or B somewhere? Well, no, I don't. So what am I going to do? Well, if you're looking at it, and if you're remembering your rules, you say, wait, A or B is an OR statement. And I seem to recall there was some way for me to create an OR statement. And that way was through addition. So notice I have on line 6, A by itself. So what I'm going to do is say A or B by line 6, addition. Now, if you didn't see that, that's all right. But notice how sort of very obvious it is. It's A or B, and I have A by itself. It's addition. But oftentimes, um, that notion of addition is off-putting because it seems like I'm cheating in some way. So I'm bringing something in that I don't have, right? There's no other B in the proof, and suddenly I'm allowed to add it. But again, if we, were, if we think back about what addition says, if I have something true, whatever I add, that resulting OR statement is still going to be true because I already know that A is true. So regardless of whether B in some cosmic sense is true or false, doesn't matter because I know the conjunction or the disjunction A or B is definitely true. So now I've got the A or B, which means I can now do a modus ponens move, right? So this is the same as the antecedent in line one. So that means I can write down the consequence C or D, and that's lines one and 11 modus ponens. And what I'm looking for is the um, D so that I can get the Z out of line 10 now. So how do I get D out of there? Well, I have to break this apart. I already have a not C in line 8. So with that, I can write down D from lines 12 and 8, disjunctive syllogism. And again, if you're not seeing that, make sure you go back and refer to your rules so that you can see um, how I'm doing that. But line, it's clear that C or D not C, therefore D. That's a straightforward um, disjunctive syllogism. Now I've got D, and that's exactly what I wanted because with line 10, D therefore Z, the antecedent D is repeated. It's a clear modus ponens, and I get C from lines 10 and 13 modus ponens. And there you go. That's the way, and this, in this case, um, perhaps there's other things I could have done it doesn't appear so that there are any obvious moves. As we get to the rules of replacement, there might be um, alternate ways of doing the proof. But this one, in this case, I think this was the most straightforward way of getting the answers with the, the rules that you currently know.